Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 5th edition Vampire the Masquerade tabletop role-playing rules by World of Darkness. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. Listeners should know that this podcast is intended for a mature audience and will include strong language and mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and so forth, that may bear resemblance to entities living, dead, or undead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Rena Henze, and for tonight's game, I will be your storyteller. Greetings and welcome to another episode of the Old Ways Podcast's Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle Blood Moon Rising. I am your storyteller, Storyteller Rena, and tonight we are bringing you another of our character prologues to introduce our coterie to all of you, our wonderful listeners. So, without further ado, I'd like to briefly turn the spotlight towards our subject tonight. Um, Last time we had Marcus the Bruja, so... Let's see who we have joining our coterie this evening. Tiff? Hi, this is Tiffany, and I'm playing Alex Giovanni. They are Clan Hecata, and they like to hoard bits of information. It makes things fun. Yes, we do love a good bit of information hoarding. So we'll we'll see what you're able to do with your network of information uh, as we go and just to clarify Alex does use they them pronouns correct correct excellent all right so let us begin it is yet another cold october evening in san francisco with the wind coming off the bay there's a light drizzle of rain outside as so frequently happens at this time of year. And Alex is awakening for the first time this evening. So why don't you tell us a little bit about where Alex sleeps? Uh, How do you get your rest during the day? They usually are in the back portion of a storefront. Well, it looks like a storefront. The uh, back half of it is more like a spacious apartment. It's not small, but not huge. And everything is always meticulously in its place and clean and straightened and tidy. So when Alex rises, usually they will pick out their suit for the evening, make sure everything is perfect, no fuzz, no wrinkles, no hair out of place, and get ready for what the evening may bring. Excellent. So as you uh, arise this evening, maybe stretch a little bit, uh, you feel a bit of hunger gnawing away inside you, why don't you give me a rouse check to see how hungry you are and if you can control it. So that's going to be 1d10 and you want a 6 or higher. So that is a nine. Okay, so with a nine, that is a success. So you're feeling a a little bit hungry, but you can wait. You don't need to feed immediately. You don't feel the need to rush off uh, and devour the nearest living being that you see or the nearest bucket of blood, whatever you find first. So you're able to go about your evening routine as normal. Do you have people you keep around you at this time of night? Are you solitary? Probably just the uh, guy that runs the front of the the store. So Max runs the front of the store, so I will probably see him for a little bit, check in, make sure everything he has everything he needs. And then if I need to, I will probably stop in and see my hacker friends 
for my herd and get what I need and check in and see if they have any, if they've tracked down any other interesting information or tidbits. Are your hacker friends uh, in the same building? Do you have to go out to find them? If, I see, I don't think I got my wealth high enough because it's only a three. I would say if I could get the whole building, yeah, I would have them all living above me in apartments. But otherwise, I'm sure they're fairly nearby. Okay, so maybe all along the same street. Mm-hmm. So you get uh, get dressed for the evening's activities. You're wearing a, a very nice, well-tailored uh, dark suit, it's dark blue. Do you wear a tie, or is that not your style? Usually, I would go with like a silk, like scarf, you know, or I forget what they call them, but you know, like a yeah, more of like a scarf than a mm-hmm. than a uh, tie per se. Okay. So you've got a, a nice dark colored silk scarf, uh, maybe a dark green hanging around your neck. And you exit through the front uh, of the building. You wave at Max um, and he just smiles at you. It's usually fairly quiet at this time of night. Sunset in San Francisco uh, in October is around 6, 6.30. So he's expecting maybe a couple customers will come in but it's usually fairly quiet. So he's got a paperback out and he's sitting in a chair behind the desk with his feet propped up on a stool. And he just sort of gives you a, a wave and a cheery smile uh, before he returns his, uh, his attention to his novel. He always seems to be reading the same novel uh, it, as if he has to keep going back over and over and over because he's not really paying full attention to it but it keeps him busy and he's never really complained. Right. You make your way out into the street. It, it's not a super busy area of town. You do get cars going past you. Some people who very obviously are taking shortcuts to get away from the famous traffic. But you know, it's a little bit of a drizzle, cool breeze coming in from off the bay. And uh, you have to make your way up one of the hilly streets uh, to get to where your your hacker colleagues live, but you're used to the walk. It's nice, good to stretch your legs, get some fresh air. You don't go out very much usually, so this is uh, this is a nice little exercise for you. And a few cats come running past you as you go. They seem almost drawn to you. Uh, there's a small black cat named Dante that you see occasionally uh, when you take these evening walks and he stops for a nuzzle and for a pat on the head before he runs off in search of squirrels or whatever it is he chases at night. So you get up to the apartment block where you can find your friends. They live in this sort of nondescript high-rise building that has a ton of small apartments, uh, still outrageously expensive because it's San Francisco but they can live fairly anonymously in one of these tiny one-room apartments each without attracting too much attention. You make your way up to the seventh floor and you knock on the door of apartment 712. Do you have a code knock or phrase or do you just knock and expect them to answer? I probably have like a special knock, like how like how soft or how hard I would knock. Usually soft because I don't want, you know, everyone around us to hear that they have company. Right. So you hear a soft click that you know is the, the peephole cover being lifted and then closed. And then you hear the sounds of multiple locks being undone there are at least five of them, including the chain on the door. Uh, but at last, the uh, the door swings open, and there is a fairly lanky-looking young person. They're in their mid-twenties, and looks a bit like they haven't showered for a couple days, and there are Cheeto stains on their fingers and what looks like uh, maybe a spilled Mountain Dew down the front of their white t-shirt. Holes in their jeans and they're wearing fluffy slippers. But the rest of the apartment is really clean. It's just they're a disaster. 
So this is Maxine. Right. One of your little hacker friends. And Maxine looks at you with caffeine bloodshot eyes. She's holding a looks like a massive can of Red Bull in one hand and you can see past her to her desk where there are six or seven empty cans of Red Bull. It's just scattered around the desk. Oh, hey boss. Uh, Come in. Thank you. And I will enter the (laughs) apartment. Cool. The door clicks closed and then she takes a minute to refasten all of the five locks on the door before turning around and like uh coffee no we don't drink coffee uh you wanted something yes what i'm usually here for oh right 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 sorry i've been up for like 52 hours and my brain isn't quite quite connecting I think so I think that's the right word I don't know have you gotten anything for being up for 52 hours oh yeah 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 and she shuffles over in her fluffy pink slippers back to her computer. She's got six monitors all set up so that she can see pretty much everything without even even needing to turn uh, more than a slight tilt of the head to either side. And there are a pair of broken blue light glasses on the desk <laughs> that have been there for at least a month and she hasn't bothered to fix or replace. But she starts flipping through, like scrolling through a bunch of uh, files on the on the computer and she's uh, which one did you want again? Were you the one who wanted the info on Conrad? Was that you? Yeah, I, I do. I did receive something from Trevor Conrad. Right. Right, 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 right. Right. And you're you're used to all of this by now, but it's still a little frustrating just how long it takes her to get to anything when she's sleep deprived. But she pulls up some folders. So it it's really hard to find information on this guy. Um he's really good at hiding his tracks kinda like you. Um but it, it looks like uh, there was a bit of trouble at his nightclub. He pulls up a police report. Uh, the police report is dated from three days ago, which is the day before you got um, a message from Trevor Conrad. Um, so I, I managed to find, it looks like someone buried this because it didn't make the news, but apparently three people died. And they were underage. Oh, boy. Yeah. And she pulls up three uh, pictures. They look like social media images of these three teenagers. Yeah. Polly Anderson, he was 18, so he definitely shouldn't have been there. Um, And Susie Newman and... 17. Uh-uh. Uh, oh. Uh. Um, and then Andy Varis, and he's also 17. Um, and the police report says it, it looked like they were drugged or something. Maybe they overdosed? Um, not, not sh- really sure, because there's no autopsy reports or anything yet. But, yeah... It doesn't look good. Yeah. Not at all. And yeah, like it's not in the papers. Uh, and she pulls up a bunch of different paper reports. Um, and she's like, there's there's nothing here. And you'd think with, you know, three teenagers dying in a night a well-known nightclub that 
uh, there'd be something, but there's nothing. And so he's obviously got some friends. This Conrad guy obviously got some friends who are covering some things up, but I think it's going to be trouble for him because I don't think there's any way to completely get away with uh, three teenagers dying in your club. Or I guess it's his dad's club. It's a little hard to find the, the paperwork on this place, actually. Like, the only reason I knew it existed was from the paperwork. Uh, and she looks, she looks up, perks up a little bit like, like a dog that's brought you uh, a ball back. Like, did I do good? Did I do good? <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So, um, he's in real trouble if, and so I, I don't know what all you can do for him. Um, or, or maybe, maybe you're trying to get dirt on him. I don't know. It's not my place to ask. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. But, uh, yeah, that, this is deep shit, man. I have an idea what he needs, but thank you for the information. Why don't you take the rest of the night off, take a shower, and make sure you sleep? Shower. Oh, that's what I forgot to do. And she just sort of lifts her, her shoulder and sniffs and goes, Ugh. she pushes herself back in her chair and it goes rolling across the floor. And she's like, yeah, I should shower. Yeah, shower. <gasps> Oh, I don't know if I fed the cat. And she just stumbles off into the hallway, muttering things to herself. She remembered to close off, like, shut down her computers so that the information and everything isn't still up and running. But she is off in her own little world at this point, now that she has done the task she was told to do. I'm also going to go to her refrigerator and see if she has left a deposit mm -hmm. for me to take. So you open the fridge as you normally do, and there are a couple IV bags of blood. One of them is labeled from the previous week, and the most recent one is uh, looks to be from last night, uh, which might also explain her kind of wooziness and not quite all togetherness. But there, there's a couple IV bags of, uh, of tasty, tasty blood for you. Yeah, I will take a take them and close her fridge leave her clean bags and uh, and supplies probably would uh, wipe down her desk because I can't handle it <laughs> and make sure she uh, gets in the shower okay mm -hmm. like just listening because you know I don't want her falling and mm -hmm. dying in the shower <laughs> uh, you, you hear some uh, you hear the shower start to run you hear some EDM playing very loudly from uh, from the speaker on her phone in the bathroom and she starts it, it sounds like she's trying to sing it's not a very pleasant sound but she does <laughs> sound like she is at least semi-cognizant in the shower alright then I will unlock all the door well yeah I'll unlock everything and then um, make sure that the knob is at least locked when I leave she can come out and lock the rest of the locks which she most certainly will so you you lock the door on your way out almost tripping over a large orange tabby cat that has come out from behind the couch and just sort of looks at you sniffs and stalks off towards the kitchen and so you're you're able to get out fairly quickly uh, once you've cleaned up her desk and maybe left some Clorox wipes as a hint. Right. You, Which never really works with, uh, with Maxine, so... But you have gotten what you came for, both in terms of sustenance and information, so what would you like to do? I will probably head to the nightclub if I need to call an uber then i will do so and then yeah head to that uh to trevor's place and see what's going on yep so the nightclub is called the blue orchid and you being who you are you know this place fairly well it's a fairly well-known toreador hangout spot trevor and Trevor and his father are both Ventru, and by father we mean sire. Ugh. 
they have a ton of money and Trevor's uh, sire sponsored this club for him uh, and he turned it into a spot where the uh, Toreador liked to come out and be seen do get a decent number of Ventru there as well, sitting in the back going over their business dealings but also making note of who's there so that they can wield some power later on but you're, you're fairly familiar with this place, especially the fact that the patrons will bring in young humans, young mortals and get them high dance with them, get them drunk, feed off of them, and then leave them somewhere else the following day with no memory of where they were. So it's actually fairly concerning to you that the club and the name of the club have made it anywhere, including a police report. That That's bad news. Very bad news. Well, I have a feeling what they need me for, but, you know, we'll see. <laughs> So you pull up on the street where the club is. It doesn't have a large sign outside announcing what it is or anything, of course. And your your Uber driver, who's a Pakistani guy, just sort of looks at you with a furrowed brow as if, are you sure this is where you want to go? I just nod and hand him uh, money and a tip. Well, I'd probably do that from my phone but give him a large tip. Tell him, thank you. And then exit the vehicle. He shakes his head a little bit, but uh, he gets the notification of the tip through through the app, and that makes him a little uh, happier about the situation. And he, <laughs> he drives off, and as he does, you can make your way down this dark uh, alley into... Th- there's a kind of old office building that was left fairly run down. People think it's a squatter's building, but you know that down in the basement, there's the fairly lively nightclub for kindred, particularly Ventru and Toreador to show up. So you can go in through there. It's not hard for you to get in. It's fairly obvious that you're one of the one of the kindred, so they just sort of wave you on in. There's very, very loud salsa music playing right now. And there are couples dancing, some of them more like air quotes dancing. Salsa in this uh, in this dance floor in the middle. Um, <laughs> you see several very flamboyantly dressed Toreadors. A couple of them you recognize as local models or um, Instagram influencers dancing with very obviously drunk uh, or high humans. But these humans at least look to be of age. And you see one young vampire just leaning down as if to whisper in his date's ear. And you, but you see a small trickle of blood going down the young woman's neck, which is not exactly the way things are, are usually done, but kids these days, right? And you have entered the club. What would you like to do? <laughs> I'm going to go up to the bartender, tell the bartender that uh, Trevor asked to see me. Um, The bartender is a uh, short, fairly broad-shouldered vampire dressed all in uh, black rolled-up sleeves. And they look up at you, uh, sort of looking you over. Giovanni? Yeah? Okay, yeah. Boss is expecting you that way. And they uh, point with their thumb to a back door behind the bar. I will uh, go to the back door. So there are a couple very muscular looking humans. You know them to be uh, recently ghouled by the look of them standing with their arms crossed outside the door, but they see you coming and they look at each other and they nod and then they open the door and allow you to go through. They were obviously expecting you. And as you go in, the atmosphere in this room is very different from the main part of the club that you just walked through. It's very quiet in here. There is a hazy bit of smoke 
smells a bit like marijuana, but the really high end kind. And you see Trevor Conrad reclining on a couch, a very bright blue, very garish compared to everything else that you've seen so far crushed velvet it looks like something from the 70s and he's reclining on this couch he's wearing a must up business suit but the jacket's been thrown off the white shirt has been half torn open you can see buttons on the floor his shoes and socks are off and he's reclining there with what looks like a young woman hard to hard to tell age or anything from this this angle but she's laying on the couch and he has half raised himself up and her blouse is pulled aside and you can see bite marks across her chest with blood pouring out of them from here and her eyes are kind of rolled back and she looks to have the sort of blissful ecstatic resting face as, as she can't see him at this moment. She just appears to be completely out of it. But as you enter, Trevor looks up and he draws a hand. He draws a hand across his bloody mouth. He goes, ah, uh, uh, Alex, uh, Giovanni, uh, uh, welcome, welcome. I wasn't expecting you uh, this early. Um, and he hastily tries to button up his shirt and realizes there's no buttons there. <laughs> I will just look with no expression and uh, tell him, well, when there's business to be done, the fun must wait. He looks down at the the girl on the couch. Uh, Yes, um, just a light snack. Um, uh, You know, uh, quick and easy. And uh, he just sort of pushes her slightly to the side and he gets up just completely ignoring how must up everything is about him and he pokes his head out the door and whispers something to one of the the guards and the bodyguard comes in picks up the girl and takes her out into the main area of the nightclub and the door shuts again and Trevor sits back on the couch and looks up at you expectantly so I hear that you've had some problems. Problems, one way of putting it, I suppose. Uh, yes, problems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, considering there's a police report, I would call it a very big problem. Oh, God. There wasn't supposed to be any paperwork. Oh, God. Oh, God. My sire's going to kill me. And he starts rubbing his temples as if he has a really bad hangover. So to me, it sounds like you really need help. Oh, yes, yes, help. It's nothing like this has ever happened before. Uh, Sammy usually vets all the, the humans we bring in to make sure they're the right age and... And no one will miss them. You know, usually uh, he nods his head towards the doors like party girls and, and, you know, rich trust fund babies who are expected to show up drunk or overdose or whatever anyway. How was I supposed to know that they were high schoolers? God. Well, what happened that night? Uh, well... Okay, so we were having a party. It was a it was a masked uh, a masked party, and because someone thought it would be fun, I don't even remember who, but I, I try to keep them happy. The customers, you know, got to keep got to keep it running. And when you've been around for as long as most of my clientele have, you want to shake things up a little bit. So they were having this masked party, and. Uh, and something to do with leather. Uh, I don't judge, I don't judge, but you know, uh, it got a little risque. And, um, well, I had Sammy bring in a bunch of, of new humans 
you know, new partners, getting them to come to this party. And um, we, well, you know, this time we, we told them we had a, a new type of, of, of heroin and, uh, and we got several of them, several of them in and I should have known there was something, something wrong with those three. I should have... Oh, but you, how can you expect me to know? I'm not out there doing all of that. That's Sammy's job. And he just starts rambling on, trying to absolve himself of guilt for a few seconds. Who is the Sammy? Human? Oh, yeah, one of my ghouls. He's been in been with me in the club for the last two years. He's usually a very good purveyor of, of fresh, live ones. You know, the kind who like to party and get down and won't remember anything in the morning. So I, I trusted him. I trusted him and uh, can't believe he'd, he'd, he'd do that. But there were these, these three kids know their names. So they've got to be around somewhere. Um... Uh, police took their ID and whatnot, but uh, one one of them, um, the girl, uh, sh- she was with. I shouldn't say who she was with, but uh, they they went back into one of the uh, rooms to have a little fun, um, and apparently he couldn't complete the job because she came out screaming. And there was blood everywhere, and then her two friends, being young human males, apparently rushed in to try and... I don't know what young human males do anymore, but avenge her honor or something. Um, And... We couldn't stop them in time, and, well, they were kind of torn apart. Okay. And I sent Sammy to stop the girl one, but she'd run out screaming into the street, and someone had called the police, and she was dead by the time they got here, but they had already been called. Luckily, I had time to clean out most of the clientele, but uh, damage was already done. At least it wasn't worse. Well, <clears throat> what is it that you want me to do? I need this to, to go away. Can you find any information on on these the dead ones that um, or that were their parents or something pressure to, to make them stop they weren't the normal party kids drug addicts sort of things so people actually want to know where they are and I've managed to keep their names out and I don't even remember their names but daddy took care of it um, and well I don't want them finding out about the police report and coming back here. Can you mislead them or get them to stop blackmail? I, I don't know. Do your your thing. But I was told you were the best. Well, usually I deal with the dead. Well, they're dead. Right. But you're asking me to talk to their living counterparts. Well, can't no, you don't have to talk to them. You could uh, def- uh, establish a fake social media trail or something. They went off to Peru. I don't know. Yes, I do have ways of taking care of this. However, I don't know if you have enough to pay. Mm-hmm. We-, we can, we can manage it. Really. Uh, yes. Um, my sire is, well, let's just say he, 
heads up a board of uh, other Ventru in the political sphere, and I may hear some things that maybe I shouldn't be hearing, just may. Mm -hmm. That could be uh, useful to you in your occupation. For the next six months. He blanches as much as a vampire can blanch. (laughs) Yes, fine. Just make it go away. Make it go away. Good. You will hear from me soon. (sighs) Or not. He blinks and looks confused and a little terrified. (laughs) And remember, if anyone knows that you are speaking with me outside of this encounter bad things will happen oh uh, no 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 uh, i'm the very very soul of discretion yes yes no one no one no one will know no 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 i i don't even remember your name good nice doing business with you and i will turn and just walk out the door. You walk out, um, and you hear you hear him in the background pulling out a cell phone. It sounds like he's uh, texting someone just from the the various sounds that the phone makes. You don't know who he's texting or what he's texting them, but you know, maybe it's just texting his sire to tell him that the situation's under control, but who knows? I will then go to one of the other apartments with the other hackers, because Maxine should be sleeping, and I'm not going to bother her again. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go visit them and ask them to pull up the police report, get rid of the police report, and search up any information on those three. Eddie, the uh, second young hacker, who looks much more alert and awake and is as if he actually slept last night um, (laughs) or during the day, uh, just says, uh, yeah, yep, yep, you got it, boss. Uh, And he immediately gets to work with laser focus. And you see a small pill bottle labeled Adderall. (laughs) On the, on the desk next to him, but he is very intensely focused and does not even seem to notice as you move away from him. I'm just going to leave like a little post-it note because I know when he gets focused, I can't speak with him. Mm-hmm. That says, call or text with any other information to make these people disappear. And then I'll just stick it on the desk. Yeah, you leave the post-it note. He doesn't even notice that you put anything there, but this has probably happened before. So you are are used to this method of, of communication. Uh, Eddie's a lot less verbose than Maxine. Which I prefer because, you know, I don't want to waste my time talking to humans. Yeah, Eddie doesn't waste your time. He's very focused and he gets right to work and you know that he'll get back to you very quickly as soon as he breaks his concentration. Yeah, I'm going to give him time and uh, probably head back to my place and see what else is going on for the evening. Okay, so you go back to your place and the shop is closing up at this point since it's fairly late in the evening and a tech shop isn't going to stay open super late. Right closed sign is in the window but you you wave at the watchman as you go upstairs as you go up the stairs towards your apartment I would like you to make an awareness and intelligence roll let's say wits so awareness and wits so that'll be 5d10 so it's 1, 2 Okay, so two successes. All right. 
Yeah, because it's six or higher, correct? Six or higher. Mm -hmm. Yep, two. So with with two successes, um, that's enough to make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And as you approach the door, you think someone's in there. Hmm. Well, I think somebody's in there. I will probably just stalk in, like, sneak in, basically. Be Mm -hmm. as quiet as possible. Okay. Uh, So if you want to sneak in, give me stealth and subterfuge. So that's going to be for you for 4d10. Um, and because you have to open the door, this is going to be a bit more difficult, right? So you're going to need three successes here. I did get it! Six, seven, and an eight. Sweet. Alright. So you managed to open the door extremely quietly, uh, and you're old enough that you've learned how to move without making a sound. And you've lived in this apartment so long, you know where all the creaky boards are and all the places where the tile squeaks and so on. So you're able to slip in quietly. And you see in this uh, this living area, right, there is a man. He's got his back to you and he's facing out the window at the San Francisco surroundings, the the skyline. He's got his hands clasped behind his back very casually. He's wearing a long, dark trench coat, uh, and you see a dark fedora on an end table next to to your couch. He doesn't seem to have noticed you. I will. Yeah, I will uh, walk up and, well still be sneaking, but be about a foot behind this person and uh, lean over and ask them is there anything I can help you with? He turns around to look at you and he, he doesn't seem ruffled or anything by your quiet approach. He looks up at you, he's fairly short, he's shorter than you are, and he's got lean, like fox-like features, very sharp inquisitive eyes and um, a small but nose that almost kind of seems to be sniffing all the time like sniffing the air for danger and very sharp high cheekbones and he look, tilts his head and he looks up at you and you know this man this is Luther Garibaldi the sheriff of San Francisco he is the prince's right hand enforcer and Luther looks up at you and says, hmm. Good evening, Alex. I assume you have a message? Of a sort. Of a sort. I need some information. Hmm. And he moves over to the couch and sits down without being invited. That he's. His posture is all, always. Every time you've seen him, he's always ready to leap up at a moment's notice, and all of his senses are on alert. He's a he's a gangrel, and so um, his nose quivers a little bit. uh, But you notice, just he looks tense. And what kind uh, of information are you looking for? There's a Malkavian prophet. Oracle, something, causing some difficulties for my clan, let's say. And whatever they said to everybody, well, I can't get anyone to give me a straight answer. I want you to tell me what they saw and what they said. It could really, really destabilize the balance of power around here if they don't cooperate. Do you have a name? Ah, Yes, Dinah Forthright. I don't think it's a real name. <laughs> Forthright, indeed. 
do we know any frequents? Where this person hangs out. They've been seen in Chinatown. That's where my last contact saw them. And your contact has not seen whatever this uh, Malkavian is doing? Well, my contact's gone. That's the problem, you see. Oh, interesting. You may have noticed, Alex, with your keen interest in all the goings-on in these parts, and with your web of little spiders, the gangrels are leaving. I have noticed, but you're not. He looks affronted. I have a job. I have a duty. I serve at the will of the prince. Got it? Yes, that is the most fun. He licks his lips a little bit. You see his fangs. Like... Oh, well, I do get to indulge in some of my passions for violence. And as you know, there are too many cooks in the gangrel kitchen, too many vying for leadership. Whereas here, only the prince is above me, and, well, no one can argue with that. You know this, Alex. Why would I leave? Hmm. Then I guess the only other uh, question I have is... What is the payment? Yes. You understand, this is not officially from the prince. This is a pet project of mine, but I have some information coming in very soon. Perhaps you've heard of the disappearance of our noble prince's clan siblings. Hmm? Hmm? Only two were left. Not many of the Nosferatu still around here anymore. You mustn't tell the prince I told you about this, but one of them hasn't disappeared. Hmm. He's dead. And how do you know this? Because I've been the one investigating how he died. Hmm. The prince takes it very seriously, you know. Not many of their clan left here. Only two siblings of the same generation still on the west coast. (sighs) Well, one, I suppose. Though we don't know where that other one is. And you didn't think to contact somebody who can speak with the deceased? Well, it happened only a couple days ago, you see. And the prince has not decided what they want done about it. It was very disturbing. But we still have a body, correct? Parts of one. Hmm, that might work. Well, you can relate to the prince. Not officially. Of course just a suggestion maybe to put you into Prince's favor that sometimes there are some clans that can see how someone has died well you know our Prince very old fashioned the Nosferatu and Prince Velasquez more so than others But I appreciate the favor. (laughs) Unofficially. Well, with that, I will see if I can find this Dina forthright. I agree. That is a terrible name. (laughs) Right. You'd think in this era you could come up with something more interesting if you're going to go by a pseudonym. Well, I mean, people are naming themselves after cars and states and... Very well. And suddenly his his body just kind of goes rigid and he stretches his neck out, tilts his head and... 
sniffs. <laughs> oh, there's a human in this building. Uh, one of yours. You can see his fingers are just sort of tightening and, and unclenching over and over. Uh, he's usually a bit more restrained in your presence, at least when he's on official or unofficial business, but... <laughs> Such a shame. We'll have to hunt elsewhere. Shame. Shame. Smells like a mm, good vintage. Uh, but, of course, I'm not going to trespass upon your herd. <laughs> no, no, no. That would be uncouth. Indeed it would. And he picks up his fedora, puts it on his head, and uh, he goes to the door. He turns and he looks at you and says, Unofficially, it was a pleasure doing business with you. Unofficially. Got it? As with you. <laughs> Always unofficially. And he flashes this little feral smile, his sharp little fangs. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm getting hungry. Luther departs, leaving the faint aroma of cigarette ash behind. And you have a few mysteries on your hands. Indeed. I have a lot of work to do. You do. It's a good thing you like doing that, don't? isn't it? Well, having um, a six-month favor is going to be is going to come in handy, so uh, mm. it'll be worth it. It certainly will. So I think we'll leave it there for this evening. Thank you, Tiffany, for joining us uh, for this prologue, and I hope all of you at home are enjoying uh, hearing more about Alex Giovanni. And we'll be back later with another character to delight your ears.